Hello, everyone. Um, I think we'll be joined shortly by a floating avatar in the universe. Uh -huh. um, avatar. Oh, there we go. Hey. Great. Hey, Antoni. Yeah, I hope you're having a good day, Avatar. Sorry, I haven't watched your second movie yet. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it is, pretty it, good. Is, it is true that Anatoly does look like he could have been an extra in the Barbie movie, but, you know. <laughs> I'm not. I don't know this, what else to this, say about that right now. But nice, nice. This, this uh, is my fame and cosplay for Oppenheimer. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, uh, as, as we learned today, uh, Vitalik prefers Bob the Builder, and uh, maybe we'll, we'll we'll have Bob the Builder next time. But um, as as many of you know, this panel is uh, the the end game panel, uh, and I think uh, you know. Part of, part of this panel actually stems from last year at the last Modular Summit, which was sort of April 2022. So before Luna, when we were all, you know, felt safer, more comfortable, less annoyed at people in the world. I felt less safe before the Luna collapse. <laughs> that, maybe that's also just mm. fair, fair, fair. I, it's safer as in, uh, you know, I think the debate was actually quite different at that time. Uh, at that time, I think there was a lot more hype about monolithic architectures and modular architectures were sort of coming from behind. And I'd say, obviously, some of the stuff that happened in the last year made people people f flip or, you know, things change. The, the Luna stuff, like, it had lots of moral lessons for me, but, like, totally nothing to do about monolithic versus modular. So I'd love to hear that case. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's more like app chain versus monolithic. Yeah. Luna, I think, yeah. Right, but like, okay, I guess to me, like, Luna was not bad because Luna was monolithic versus modular or like on Ethereum versus on Bitcoin versus on, um, you know, Cosmos versus or Solana or whatever, right? Luna was bad because it was a fundamentally bad design. Like, the exact same design carbon copied onto Ethereum would have been just as big a, a, a collapseful failure. For sure. I, I, I'm more pointing out that at this time, people were much more living in 2021 land. Okay, this is true. And, and like, that was when, you know, I think the mm. psyche was broken, right? So was, I, I just wanted right. to say, like, That's give, fair, give yeah. some context well, of, like, the last time we did this. Yeah, there was well, sort of, modular was really the underdog. Yeah, it's like, I feel like there were like a lot of arrows, right? Like, remember the scene where like Boromir just like gets like shot down by a bunch of orc arrows at the same time? And it's like, you know, first you have Luna and then like you got the Celsius arrow and then yes. you got, um, and then you got the, the, the big FTX arrow and then he's kind of dying. And then there's just like one extra arrow from like, what was it? I guess like DCG or whatever, just like shoots in. Yeah. But so so there's been a lot of arrows. Indeed. <laughs> More than three. Uh, well, may over. all our future arrows be in beautiful diagrams. There you go, exactly. Well, commutative diagrams only. Uh, you know, we, we're, we're all secretly category theorists. I don't know, I, I prefer non-commutative because like, you know, we want to have progress, right? Like we don't want to just like go from the same place. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Well, clear, clear, clearly, clearly there's already even debate about whether anything has changed since last year. So hmm. maybe, maybe Anatoly and Mustafa, let's start with, you know, in the last year, what uh, what in the monolithic versus modular worlds has changed from your minds? Yeah, so I think like um, one of the biggest changes is a year ago there wasn't really um, any kind of like frame roll up frameworks. You know, there was like optimism, arbitrum, and all, all other kind of like optimistic roll ups, but there was no kind of frameworks to to kind of create your own roll up. Now we have you know Upstack, we have arbitrum, orbit, like rollkit as well. And I think um, kind of last year, a lot of emphasis was <clears throat> the, the main reason why you need roll-ups is scalability, which is true. But I think there's been a, what I've realized over the past year is that um, one of the most underappreciated aspects of, uh, of roll-ups and modularity is that it gives developers more choice and freedom over the execution environments. And that lets you do really cool things that just haven't fundamentally been possible before. You know, you can modify the EVM and add a ZK opcode so you don't have to you know, use, you, have, you can do more efficient ZK verification than just Roth 16, and that's really good for privacy. Or for example, you know, Curio has modified their EVM game engine to add their entire game as an opcode on, on, the, on, the, on the app stack, which can be fault proven on, on their MIPS fault proving system. So I think this kind of like this flexibility of execution environments um, is really unappreciated, and I think like might, might be as just as bigger or as, as, as important um, to, for impacts of the space as, as the scalability aspects. Anatoly? I think um, 
it's been really cool to see the development of, of uh, rollups and having them ship and actually seeing their performance numbers. <clears throat> and from my perspective, I've never thought of them as scalability technologies because fundamentally, you're still limited by the bandwidth of the layer one. And uh, if you can't exceed that, you can't really scale beyond that. We can do all, all sorts of other tricks, but that's kind of like the bottleneck. And when you start scaling that piece, we haven't yet seen folks go beyond what a monolithic architecture that can provide. Um, so I think that's coming. I actually am pretty bullish on uh, things like light clients giving pretty close to better than honest majority assumptions between shards and all these other things. So I'm excited to see for that next iteration in like the actual base layer. But uh, so far from my perspective, like actually the, the main use case for rollups is that like giving new execution environments, giving new ways for devs to, to build, you know, a full game as a fraud provable thing. I think that that's a really, really cool thing. Vitalik? Any, any it's stuff? interesting because I think uh, like pre-2019, Vitalik was fully on board with the idea that rollups are not real scalability technologies, but then like that was when I moved pretty decisively away from that paradigm. Like if you read my pre-2019 stuff, like I was talking about how like rollups aren't real scale because like they're not a, uh, like they're not a big O notation improvements, right? Like, you know, I talk about how regular blockchains are OFC, like their capacity is like linear in the capacity of a computer, but then like shorting is OFC squared, right? Um, but like rollups are O of C times like somewhere between 10 and 500, right? And for a long time, like the mathematical purity side of myself got really hung up on that. But then at some point I was like, okay, yeah, fine. Like a factor of 10 to 500 is still a big deal. And that, like that was when, uh, well, I guess, and at the same time, we kind of exhausted, you know, state channels and plasma and all of those things um, that, uh, you know, just realize some of the fundamental limitations that they have in terms of how plasma requires every object to have a logical owner and like the whole D, uh, you know, defragmentation problem that, um, I mean, I'm sure if Carl Forsch was here, he could t uh, tell you even more about because they tried to even implement, like actually implement that. Uh, but, but uh, the basically, yeah, like a gain of 10 to 500 X is still a gain. I think it is true that like in practice, we've been slow on getting there. One of the reasons why is because like close to half that gain comes from data compression and rollups have been pretty slow to actually implement data compression. And, uh, you know, there's like all of these reasons of like, oh, well, you know, we don't want to have L2 nodes have to be archive nodes and like all of these things, but these are, they're issues that like can be engineered away and like, e like even EVM parallelization, it's like, you know, can be engineered and there's a difference between sort of solved in your head and like hard engineering slog solved and like that's been one of my own big, uh, big learnings about the ecosystem. Um, so I think, uh, like to me, I still look at this from the perspective of like, what is this going to look like, like even three years from now, right? Because uh, like we're, we're definitely not, nowhere close to the frontier of what even currently known approaches can provide, right? And so. So, so with that, actually, uh, a great, great thing to, to talk through. You know, there have been multiple end game blog posts all over the internet, but all three of you, I'm sure, have very strong views on your views of what the end game should look like. Um, so, you know, maybe in your own world, words, define what you think the end game of the technologies you're really interested in should look like. What kind of things should they offer users? What kinds of things should they offer sophisticated actors to, to who maintain them? What should they not offer them? And, um, you know, I think having a having an eye towards you know where where you really think the long far future is i think vitalik's talk today ended with a very good picture of what he thinks the future is at least in terms of you know mm. the big mm -hmm. proof proof thing yeah yeah i mean like my view on the future is definitely that like you know, we have proofs now. And I think, uh, like, I've used the analogy that, um, you know, zero, like, succinct zero-knowledge proofs are to um, cryptography what transformers are to machine learning. Like, they're, like, they're, or to AI. Like, they're this uh, one single technology that is just so powerful all by itself. They just, like, completely, you know, like, sweeps across 
decades of hard application specific work by thousands of talented people and just says like, okay, you know, bye bye, you're gone and uh, replaces it with a, ma with a vastly better alternative, right? And like, that's just something that we have to adapt to, right? Like anything that gets built today, it uh, should be built with the assumption that like it's, that like proofs exist as an ingredient. And like that was not really part of the mindset a few years ago. And like a lot of things change when that becomes part of the mindset, right? I mean, obviously, uh, you know, like projects like Mina were I think pretty early to that. And uh, you know, had the EVM been conceived even five years later, it would have uh, looked very different. Had, I mean, even the beacon chain been conceived even a few years later, it would have, uh, I mean, it looked, it looked very different, right? Like even when the beacon chain was built, it wasn't really built with this uh, assumption of proofs in mind. And so if we yeah, have a world where we can just like assume that, you know, things can be proven and there's going to be light, like everything that can be computed is gonna have a light client of it and all of those things, like that in some sense like simplifies a lot of things. And, but um, you know, it still leaves open a pretty interesting design space of uh, what kinds of things are going to exist and there's a lot of details that you can talk about. Yeah, so to, big, to piggyback on that proofs aspect, um, when I kind of like think about the end game, I think about you know, what is scalability. Um, sca I define scalability as throughput divided by the cost for an end user to verify the chain. And so for the end game, I think like how can we maximize throughput, transaction throughput without, without increasing the end cost for the user? And that's only possible thanks to taking you know, proofs, um, you know, data availability sampling, fraud proofs, DK proofs. Um, and, and that should be the case even in the world where um, there's centralized block producers because we can still achieve the properties of a blockchain. We can still have, we can still have you know, censorship resistance and um, verifiability even in the world where there's centralized block producers um, by using things like PBS and CR lists. But to kind of go further, I can, uh, to me, the end game, I see a world where the, it will be easier in the future for developers to de create their decentralized application by deploying a roll-up chain than deploying a smart contract. Simply because in a world where there's proofs, there's simply, I don't see, uh, there's no, there isn't a good strong reason for um, apps that are not too directly connected to each other to be, to be sharing computational resources when the computation can happen on their own environment and simply have a proof that it happened correctly. All right. I think the biggest exception to that is composability, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Anatoly, with that, I yeah, think, so I think that, we're ready, we're ready I, for, for your end game. Yeah, it's uh, kind of interesting how different it is. So I, even going into the space, you know, five years ago, I always thought that the biggest challenge was the avail avail equal and fair availability of the data itself. And this came from my experiences as kind of like amateur trader through like interactive brokers and all these other systems. Whenever I had an algorithm that I thought had an edge, my trades would always be a little slower and the data that I would need would always ar arrive a little later and I would always kind of lose. And that's because I was playing in an unfair system. Um, and the way that I designed Solana was with this idea that we have a single global message bus and it tries to propagate all the information around the world simultaneously as fast as possible at the speed of light with this kind of like end state being that, you know, imagine some crazy trade event happens in Singapore, that news wire still has to travel speed of light through fiber to a Bloomberg terminal in, in New York. But by the time that trader looks at it, a state transition propagating through Solana already adjusted for price impact. And the price information at NYSE is exactly the same as in a market running in Solana because all that data is propagating at the same time. So this is a system that I envisioned, you know, back in the day, and this is kind of still what we're building. We're trying to reduce block times from 400 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. We're trying to make sure that there's multiple concurrent block producers so you can send your transaction to the most geographically closest one. There's competition for MEB. All of the stuff gets better and better and faster. And in that world, what's cool is that, like, I think Solana obviously needs to have a lot of hardware to do that because you're sending a lot of data. You're trying to keep it all together. And rollups are not going to help you. You know, like, you're not going to improve that system by splitting up state logically. 
Um, it, that those effectively create logical shards and you're not sending information globally to everyone. You're sending information only to some of the folks, which kind of breaks the whole point. So, but that system that we're building actually helps rollups. Like in my ideal world, all of these settlement chains that have rollups should be all atomically sequenced on this one giant, super optimized, hyper fast synchronizing engine, right? That's one giant global atomic state machine. But obviously we still need trustless computation. We still need to make sure that users that can't afford the hardware have some guarantees that about like honest execution of these systems. And like, I think the research and light clients that have been done by the folks, you know, like the teams on the stage has been awesome. And I think in the future, like Solana for Solana to function, it has to have those capabilities as well. But the fundamental problem that I want to solve is that global state synchronization as close to the speed of light as possible, as open as possible to everyone in the world. Okay, so let's suppose that we, uh, we end in a world where there's only really one settlement layer and you, your chain of choice becomes an L2 of the other chain. I only ask this question because Anatoly's been writing a lot of tweets about putting, uh, you know, making Solana, uh, making Ethan L2 of Solana. How, how, how does that, I mean, first of all, Anatoly, maybe you want to explain your tweets because I, 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 am, I'm, I personally was very confused when I read them, but. <laughs> I, I was trying to uh, create, a, I guess, a, a straw man to demonstrate that what an L2 is, is there's a mechanical component to it, which is a, a trust a, a bridge with better than honest majority assumptions that functions because all the data that you need to prove that the Merkle root that's on your L1 is correct is also on the L1. So you can then run the fraud proofs, you can basically, or whatever, compute a, a ZK proof, whatever, whatever it is that you need to do, you have all the information to validate the Merkle root, which the root itself does not have anything else, right? It's just a, just a hash. Um, so that's kind of like, you can do that with anything. You can actually take Ethereum L1 data right now, dump it into Solana, dump the state root <laughs> that's computed from that Ethereum data, and then run an optimism style proof, right, to, to check if fraud has occurred and then do the bisection and stuff like that. Does that make Ethereum a Solana L2? Mechanically, yes. Socially, no. <laughs> One reason why is because, like, you know, there's the saying that, like, you know, the sovereign is the one that decides the exception. And in blockchains, the exception is bugs and 51% attacks. And the question is always, like, like, what happens if Ethereum hard forks, for example, right? Like, if Ethereum hard forks, then there is a few possibilities, right? Like, one possibility is that the Solana bridge, and if we assume that it's a, um, you know, perfect ZK bridge, then... According to the old ZK rules, the Ethereum chain will just start being invalid and like that bridge will just basically create its own version of, uh, you know, like basically its own Ethereum Classic 2.0, right? Um, so that's like one, but then the, the question is like, well, I mean, do the yeah, assets, like, act, like what do the assets follow, right? And realistically, in this case, the assets would follow Ethereum, right? Um, but, you know, if you get into a you know, world where, like, the majority of assets are rooted onto Solana and then bridged onto Ethereum, then, like, that would, that would look very different, right? Or another world in which, the, right, and in that case, then, like, Ethereum would not actually be capable of hard forking unless there is, like, some kind of on-chain governance, right? Or a possible third world would be a you know, world where the assets are all based on Solana, but at the same time, the uh, Solana community is willing to hard fork whenever Ethereum is willing to hard fork, right? And in that case, that's like a construction based off of, I guess, some, kind, some sort of like more deeper version of um, on-chain governance. And in that case, like you could, uh, you know, you would still be able to call Ethereum and <clears throat> and L2, but it would be part of this ecosystem where sort of like things are basically, yeah, I mean, like willing to 
be part uh, be part of the governance of each other. So I think you know, like yeah, like you basically just have to look at you know like what happens if one chain or the other chain gets 51% attacked, and what happens if like what happens if one chain or the other chain gets 51% attacked, and the community decides to do a yeah, like a user activated soft fork to kill the attackers. Right, so not like a, an easy slashing hard fork, but like a censorship hard fork where the community responds by picking the minority chain and on the minority chain, the, yeah, you know, the majority would have to either skip being on that chain or get slashed. And if they skip being on that so, chain, then so they get leaked. Yeah, and then like what happens in that case, right? So yeah. the thing is though, that there's always gonna be subset of users that are hardcore cypher funks, censorship resistant maximalists that will always pick the, the right hard forks. They will always fork Solana and Ethereum to towards the right state. So, that, that, that's so the real L1 is inside of all of us. Like, uh, <laughs> then this, um, you know, this gets into like an, yet another theater of the debate we've been having since 2015. You know, which chain is the real Ethereum? Who here thinks Ethereum Classic is the real Ethereum? But well, I think that's a, that's some good bravery. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, <laughs> that's way bad. higher than I expected. Yeah. Um, I'm going to be thinks, honest. Uh, who here thinks Bitcoin Cash is the real Bitcoin? Yeah, I, mean, I think this kind of like gets to into the beats um, of like how you define L2 or and, and so on and so forth versus what's a side chain. But like that, but those definitions aside, I, I still think it's an interesting proposition or useful to um, like have a validating like Solana. The bridge between Solana and Ethereum would be validating, like because not, not, most bridges between trust zones are not validating. They just have a committee-based assumption. But like if the Ethereum, if the Solana bridge to Ethereum at least verified. Um, the Solana state, you know, via zk proof or fraud proof, I think you could, I, and then even if the DA wasn't on Ethereum and the DA was on Solana and there's a committee assumption, I think that would at, le it would at least be, um, as far as I can tell, the same security properties as a Validium or an optimistic chain, which is like a, kind of like a much better s scenario for like a multi-chain ecosystem. So one thing that did come up in, in all of these answers to, to whether it's possible for one settlement layer to usurp another one and make it an L2 is uh, the role of governance in these futures, in the, the modular or monolithic futures. And so, you know, I think we've, we've seen a lot of different variants of what qualifies as governance. You know, I think choosing a hard fork, following certain people is a sort of weak form of governance. We just heard John's talk about POG, which, you know, I, I don't even, I, I haven't fully processed because it was spoken at high speed, uh, to be honest. Um, but uh, I, I think, like, where do you view the role of governance in your preferred modality in towards the end game? Like, how much, you know, how minimized is it? How important is it? Where does it, where is it necessary? Where is it only sufficient? Where is it non-necessary? Yeah, I mean, I feel, I really feel like this upgrade thing, the uh, roll-up roll upgradability is the kind of like, core, like the, the core nuance that there's been a lot of debate about like, um, you know, like um, you know, Kevin from, from Optimism is arguing that all roll-ups are sovereign and there's kind of a very controversial statement. And the reason why he argued that is because he argues that, well, all roll-ups can just, the community for roll-up can just uh, upgrade a roll-up. Ultimately, what a roll-up is, is what the community defines that roll-up to be, and not the bridge. But I think there's some interesting new, nuanced questions about like um, how do we have upgradable roll-ups while keeping the security properties of a roll-up. Like the only kind of like way I know about that, I, I know of doing so is to have an upgrade delay and allow users to, to mass exit, which is not clear if it's not clear how practical that would be in an actual um, practical scenario. Yeah, this is a tough choice, right? Because um, I think. Like right now, layer two rollups are, I guess there's like two camps. There's sort of the more activist side. And if you're on the more activist side, then like I think the safe and responsible way is to like choose a delay number and like it could be somewhere between 30 and 365 days probably. And uh, if an upgrade happens and if you're not happy with the uh, upgrade or if you know governance gets taken over by evil people and the upgrade involves stealing your money, then like you just have to leave which is good enough for most users, but it's not good enough for like really long-term applications that want to base themselves on that rollup, right? And then on the other side, like I, like I know like Scroll, for example, you know, like really values the idea of like neutrality and like sticking to Ethereum principles and kind of see, really like seeing itself as being a yeah, kind of an extender of, of uh, Ethereum land. And uh, 
like something like that would be might be willing to like say like hey you know we're not at code level we're not going to be yeah willing to like deviate from anything but being a yeah you know a copy of the protocol spec and like if they do that then uh, that doesn't like it takes away that risk for applications but then it also opens up this interesting question of like if Ethereum itself upgrades, then like how would Scroll end up copying that? And then this gets into like protocol questions. Like I know this is one of those things that's like controversial within the Ethereum research team even, right? Like there's some people that are in favor of uh, enshrined rollups or like, or an enshrined like pre, like rollup assisting precompile. Like basically imagine a precompile that just does EVM validation and it just does whatever EVM validation means during the specific block. And like maybe you could let it like do either the current hard fork or the previous hard fork, and then like in the back end, clients would just implement that by like waiting for you know like whatever their preferred zk EVM proof is, for example, right? And like if you do something like that, then like you can preserve that kind of like that tight coupling for the projects that want to do that. And then if you don't do something like that, then like layer twos would basically need to have governance for the so like on-chain governance for the sole purpose of keeping, at, at the very least for the sole purpose of keeping up with uh, whatever layer one does, right? So that's uh, like, that's one of those trade-offs. So like, and then obviously the, uh, you know, the, the other side of this is like this kind of underexplored class of like crazier ideas where like someone creates a uh, layer one where that layer one is like, intentionally willing to be more, um, you know, like activist and, uh, or, or, and like basically, yeah, hard fork in such, um, in such a way that like even layer two, like, like assisting layer two is with, um, you know, like um, hard forking along with those kinds of changes. So yeah, I mean, you know, there's like a, a big set of possibilities in off-chain governance. There's a, yeah, obviously a big set of possibilities with on-chain governance as we've seen, and especially once you start like, properly moving away from the coin voting stuff. And, uh, and then there's like a, a whole set of debates about use cases of governance. Like, are you protecting against hacks and that's it? Are you improving the protocol? Are you doing public goods funding, right? Um, and then if you do public goods funding, then like, do you do it um, kind of by enshrining an on-chain mechanism or do you do this kind of like retroactive off-chain thing the way that Zcash does, right? It's like every four years they basically, as far as I can tell so far, they like decide, you know, who the public goods funders, uh, who the, the top level public goods funders are and then, they, and then they do a hard fork to give them the block reward and then that gets revisited every four years, which is like kind of cool in its own way, right? And Zcash has made the choice to be more interventionist than Ethereum and Bitcoin are. But yeah, I don't know, it's a, it's a big design space. But do you, think, do you think there's a way for, to uh -huh. allow rollups to have an upgrade, upgrade mechanism with the same security properties as a rollup, but without coin voting and without enshrining that roll up into the L1. Because that's one of the reasons like some people are interested in sovereign roll ups. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, the ch I guess the challenge with sovereign roll ups is like if you start using any assets that wh where those assets are not registered within that roll up, right, then it's like, well, for those assets that uh, you can't be sovereign, right? Yeah, unless sure. the yeah, unless you have like hyper like more activist off chain governance. Yeah, for sure. But yeah. I think like even no L1 is truly sovereign. Like you have you know USDC and U USDT, which is kind of like a mm -hmm. you know a, a non-sovereign bridge between Ethereum and Circle or Tether. So it's definitely you know sovereignty is, is a spectrum. And, you know, there's, there's definitely trade-offs though between sovereign rollups and non-sovereign. Right, that is true. I mean, you definitely could have a like try to get every application to have um, you know separate instances on all of the different uh, rollups, and so you don't like even cross rollup like kind of bridged assets don't exist anymore, and then everyone could be sovereign. But uh, well, if you do that though, like you would not be able to, like ETH would not be usable on rollups, right? Because ETH is uh, like by definition homed on Ethereum. Mm. Yeah. And and totally you need, any, you, any thoughts you, on governance? It needs, I mean, like the the major problem are zero days. All these systems are too complex to not have some really fast path to upgrade and, and deal with a zero day bug. That's kind of like the end of the day. Like you have to, I don't know how long it's going to take for us to construct something that is so simple that everyone agrees this <laughs> this can be upgraded with a thirty day delay. <laughs> We're okay with with that. Um, 
and if you have a fast path for zero days, you're kind of introducing honest majority assumptions. And I think that's mostly fine. If that if that's what we're dealing with, I think we then have to be very, very careful about how we construct those majorities. Should they be like well-known security firms, et cetera, et cetera, like kind of the, the proof of governance talk, I think went into a lot of those considerations. But but like, I think it's really, really tough to to avoid those. I think like a couple of nuances on that. Like one is you technically don't need like, you don't technically need a fast path to upgrade. You need a yeah, fast path to freeze and an arbitrarily slow path to finalize whether or not you're going to upgrade. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, like, I, def I definitely do not think that upgrade buttons should merely be a majority, right? If it's merely a majority, then, like, oh, whatever proof system you're doing technically has no votes, right? And, uh, you know, you might, uh, it's, uh, like, I think you need to have at least a 75% threshold. This is, uh, I mean, the thing that I've been pushing for in the stage one definition, obviously, um, but, like, I do think that being greater than 50, greater than 50% is, uh, importance because otherwise like it's mathematically true that the code itself has no votes. Um, and then, well, the other thing is, uh, I guess one of the ways that the Ethereum ecosystem is, do is doing this is uh, they are doing this kind of like N version thing, right? Like where, like I, I know some of the rollups want to do this, right? They want to have multiple ZKVM implementations and then the security council only gets activated if at least uh, like one of them disagrees with the other or something like that, which is, I think an interesting path too, as long as the implementations are being built independently enough. Yeah, I, I, I think like at some level, <laughs> it seems like everyone thinks that there is some necessity of governance at the bare least, bare minimum, but it may be sort of to summarize like in some ways synchronizing multiple chains in the case of the modular world or in Anatoly's view of the world kind of response measurement. Now, maybe let's take a tiny, tiny detour. Uh, imagine you had to con come up with a complement for the architecture that's the opposite of the one that you like. Like you had to find some something really favorite, like, you know, you, you were just, your, 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 your life depended on coming up with a, a really good complement for the other architecture. What would you, what would you say to your, to your fellow developer? I mean, speaking of Solana specifically, I mean, the way I see it is that Anatoly and Solana is trying to build. Uh, the way I see it is um, scalability ultimately has, is a, has trade offs between um, scalability and composability. And um, so, like, even you know, at the Ethereum centric roadmap, you have liquidity fragment, uh, some liquidity um, fragmentation of liquidity, let's say, like op optimism and arbitrum. But the way I see it is like Solana is trying to. Up, uh, trying to see as much how much throughput we can get as much as possible without any composability sacrifices whatsoever. Um, you know, that's why Anatoly doesn't see rollups as a scaling mechanism because it defeats the properties of the system he's trying to create, which is like the, basically, as I understand, the, the vision is like you know decentralized version of the New York Stock Exchange. But so I do appreciate what I appreciate about Solana is that you know they've made some great advancements in kind of execution environments. You know the parallelized execution environment. You know, it, it, that's a ma massive um, improvement, um, and I do I appreciate that. Um, like Solana is actually taking trust minimization a bit more seriously over the past year. You know, there's been some work and some proposals over trying to create light clients and f implement fraud proofs for Solana, and you know, even some proposals to tr to see how we can add data availability something to Solana. And I, yeah, I mean, I appreciate that, you know, there's a strong technical team and I appreciate the yeah, willingness to just like say, here's uh, some set of use cases that kind of we understand we're passionate about and, uh, you know, we're going to like basically optimize and like we'll be, and be willing to make the, be willing to make trade-offs to do the best that we can for them. Anatoly? Um, well, I think the data av availability sampling and the whole fraud proof construction is like, Beautiful design, it's awesome. So, and that actually is like, I think came out of the research of both, both of the, the teams here. So pretty cool. And like, uh, the really cool thing is that like everything's open source. As soon as those folks had really good ideas, I was able to understand them and start thinking about how to apply them to the Solana stack. If we, if we fast forward, you know, to, to kind of applications that you find interesting uh, either within ecosystems that you're working in or 
uh, sort of maybe even in the other ecosystems. What are some applications you're you're interested in in, in 2023 and 2024 that will be used? You know, I think a lot of ETC this year, at least from my perspective, has been quite a bit of infrastructure, seeing a lot of updates on, you know, how certain proving systems are working, you know, understanding how those developments have, have moved on. But we do at some point have to, to have to find some other applications on them. But, you know, obviously you all probably have tons of examples of these that you're most interested in. What are they? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, in, like, in the short term, there's kind of, like, been some really crazy progress in, like, gaming kind of roll-ups, you know, like, Curio managed to kind of like run a real-time strategy game with a 0.5 second tick engine using a modified EVM that adds that part of the um, game as an opcode. And there's kind of other stuff like, you know, Argus and other teams are working on interesting game engines. Now, I don't think, you know, gaming is the kind of like ultimate, you know, purpose of, or, or like the, the most, you know, real world case of crypto. But I think historically what we've seen, you know, even in computing, a lot of Advancements in, in computing has come from gaming. You know, for example, the, sh the concept of sharding actually originated from gaming. So, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of interested in following those developments there. And um, I think in the long term, they will have you know, significant impacts on applications out outside, of, outside of gaming as well. Um, I kind of uh, like want the OG application to come back. Like, I want people to like pay for coffees with like ETH, you know? I, uh, yeah, like remember back in 2013 when like this was the whole the big thing and like I would uh, I remember this was actually the very start of like my Bitcoin trip around the world um, where we would uh, have uh, Like I went to Boston and I went on a pil pilgrimage to uh, veggie galaxy and Thelonious monkfish because those were the two restaurants that accepted Bitcoin and then you know We had the Bitcoin Keats over in Berlin and like York flats or got like 10 restaurants in a block to accept it like I want that culture to come back and I think a big part of the reason it died is obvious, which is like fees got too high. But like, you know, the original pitch back then is like, hey, this is cheaper than PayPal, but then it stopped being cheaper than PayPal. But with rollups, like it actually will be again, which is amazing, right? And like, I would love to see some of, um, you know, those amazing OG things that we did back then come back now that, um, you know, the world is, or the ecosystem starting to be ready for them. Yeah, um, I think I think that will definitely happen. Like uh, we're seeing banks already using USDC for settlement. I think that will eventually be exposed to the end user. Um, like it's being used kind of on the back end, but not, it will eventually be exposed to the end user. I'm impressed. Need none of these applications so far have had any advanced cryptography. So, <laughs> uh, Anatoly. The payments privacy preserving. But okay. okay. <laughs> Anatoly. Yeah, I, I would say like simple things like payments. And DeFi, uh, I guess DeFi can be very complicated, but I think both of those really serve the two fundamental things that crypto provides, and that's self custody and this idea of a global source of truth, right? For pricing or the ability to transact, I think those are very transformative at scale. If you have everyone in the world that now has cryptographic keys that they know can move value around. Everything else can be built on top of that, you know, like real world governance, right? Like if you, if everybody knows that like we, we can all communicate and coordinate with cryptography, we can actually build very quick, fast global polit political movements that can take on action and solve real world problems, I think. But the foundation is that like cryptographic base of users that get self custody, get what they're doing. They know like what this thing means. So yeah, the simple things. I'm I'm on Vitalik's camp here. <laughs> I mean, you know, we are in France, and uh, DeFi is the French word for challenge. Okay, fine, it's pronounced DeFi, <laughs> but like, come on. I don't, like more generally, also interested in um, experimentation around DAOs and kind of like form ways of organizing people on chain. There's like this. There's um, a lot of different kind of proposals: DeFi, ReFi, Disco DAOs. Um, a lot of interest. I'm kind of like um, excited to see how that goes as well. My last question, which is a false trichotomy, but you have to pick an answer anyway, which is Barbie, Oppenheimer, or you think it's really bad that we're lionizing Oppenheimer via a movie? I choose Bob the Builder. Oh, sorry, oh, I forgot Bob the Builder. I forgot Bob the Builder. <laughs> I want to see like the the, the crypto space come up with its own like epic, you know, like you know, like we've we've had songs, right? Like uh, you know, like remember there were Bitcoin songs back then. There was um, like that 
that uh, um, love you like like a Bitcoin parody that like continues to be one of my favorite songs to this day. Like it's actually good as a song despite being a parody. There's uh, I think like didn't like Simon Delar Rivera write a novel at some point that like yeah like I like I would love to see just like us come up with a uh, a movie that is like you know uses themes from these, you know, top, top, that we care about, but is like actually good as a movie at the same time. I unfortunately saw that there was an online TV show about SBF, so maybe, maybe that's not the right type of movie, <laughs> but uh, it is, it is, that is coming out. It's that's an animated a, short. I see, it's a, an Oppenheimer for a different cause. Yeah, yeah yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the price is definitely, you know, spooked. <laughs> Anatoly, I mean, you look like you're ready to be in the Barbie movie, so like, you yeah. gotta have some opinions here. This is me cosplaying Feynman, so uh, definitely Oppenheimer. <laughs> All right, well, thanks everyone for joining us. It's been a great day of talks. We talked a lot about the public broadcasting system of the US, I mean, sorry, proposer builder separation, and uh, hope you have had a good week in Paris, and uh, enjoy. Thank you.